Welcome to the study of God's Word with pastor and author Ed Taylor, recorded live from Calvary Chapel in Aurora, Colorado. To learn more about the many resources available through Abounding Grace Media, visit us online at calvaryaurora.org or download our free app on all platforms. And now, here's Pastor Ed to take us into our study. Would you take your Bibles, please, and open them to John's Gospel, chapter 14. We're going to be in a few different places, but we're going to start in John 14 in a Bible study that I've entitled, What is an Afterglow? I do recognize that today is Palm Sunday, and and next week is the celebration of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, but I felt a burden, even while I was in New York, to bring back this message of encouraging us to experience God to experience the presence and the power and the person of the Holy Spirit. Because I believe that it's very possible that your relationship with God is just something that's in the mind. And you have forgotten that it's not just to learn and grow and study the Bible, but that God wants you to live out in his power and his strength. As we learned last time, facing difficulties in life, we don't ask the how question, relying on our own energy and our own efforts, but rather we ask the who question. Who is your God? Who is the strength of your life? Who will lead you and guide you? You know, the Bible says that those that are led by the Holy Spirit are sons of God, and we could say daughters of God as well. Those that are led by, those that are strengthened by, those that are empowered by the Holy Spirit. You know, God has revealed himself to us in a trinity. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And how careful we need to be as a church that values the word of God, that studies the word of God, that uses extensively the word of God, not to think the trinity is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Bible. It's not. The Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity, and he lives inside every true believer, animating you, empowering you, and helping you. He brings conviction of sin. He brings encouragement. He brings direction. And Jesus promised to send the Holy Spirit. Notice John chapter 14 in verse 16. This is a promise of God. He promises to send the Spirit, and he says... And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever, even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. Jesus is preparing the disciples then and reminding us today that he's going to die, be buried, he's going to rise again from the dead, he's going to walk with the disciples for a few days and then ascend into heaven. And in his absence, he is going to send, and for us we look backwards of course, he is sending the Holy Spirit to dwell in every true believer. That the Holy Spirit, we believe in the threefold work of the Holy Spirit on the earth today. He is with all unbelievers. He is in all true born-again believers. And he also comes upon believers in what Jesus called the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And he wants you not just to know him and know about him, but he wants you to experience him. I mean, if we're not careful, we'll be so caught up in Bible study You know, for some of you, you kind of think that church, maybe you were raised that way or perhaps even coming to this church, like church is just coming to a location, listening to a person speak, and then going home. But this is such a small, yet in a very important part, but it's a small part of your Christian life. You you want to learn how to live under the dependence of the Holy Spirit. We have studied the person and the work of the Holy Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit, the manifestations of the Spirit in depth. And if you still have questions about the person of the Holy Spirit and how he works in your life, go to our website or go to our app and right on the homepage of our app is a tab on the Holy Spirit. And go through those studies if you haven't already. Learn about how God reveals himself to us. How he might come and teach us and bring things to our remembrance. How he'll abide with us. How he'll help us. How he'll empower us. And we believe there's an empowering experience that comes 
with the Holy Spirit, not just something to know, but someone to experience. That God wants to touch your emotions. He's made you an emotional person. And he literally wants you to feel his presence. It's okay to say that. It's okay to say after maybe a church service or after doing devotions or after sharing the gospel, you know, it's okay to say, I felt God there. I felt like God was with me. I felt the leading of the Holy Spirit. It's not just trying to explain everything all the time. God wants you to experience him, to enjoy him, and to know that this is a relationship, not with a church, not with another person, not with a book, but your relationship is with the living God who dwells in you. And Jesus promised it. And so what happens today? There's a lot of arguing and confusion and disagreement about the Holy Spirit. And it makes sense to some degree to get people arguing and upset about the Holy Spirit instead of experiencing his presence in your life. And there's two extremes when it comes to the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Holy Spirit. On one side, on one side is something known as cessationism. And it comes from the word cease. And there are those that believe today that the Holy Spirit doesn't operate in the church today like he did in the book of Acts. Because I mean, when I read the book of Acts, it only makes me hungry and more hungry for the presence of God in my life. I want to see and experience what our brothers and sisters in the early church experienced. I think that's a hunger for many of us. Because there'll be those that look today and go, what's wrong with the church today? And why isn't the church experiencing all the things that we see in the New Testament? And one of the reasons is, is that we have a church, and when we say church, we mean us, because we're the church. We have a church today that relies on programs and, and policies and strategies. And, and while there's nothing wrong with those in and of themselves, when our plans and our strategies replace the, power, the dynamic power of the Spirit, what are you left with but yourself and your own strength? And you know as well as I do that we are weak people, that we can do, as we learn from Jesus, we can do nothing apart from Jesus Christ. As we learn from Paul that in our flesh, in me, he said, no good thing dwells. We must have the Spirit of God overpowering us and really recognize and acknowledge that he's with us. So we don't hold to the cessationism. We believe God works today just like he did in the first century. We believe that he is still moving among us. Now, the other extreme from cessation, like the Spirit doesn't work today like that, and really, cessationism only refers to a few of the gifts, not everything, not just a few of the gifts, some of the more dramatic ones, as we'll see in a moment. But on the other side is something that I've termed hyper-expressionism. Uh, those of you that come from a more Pentecostal background might be able to relate to this. Pentecostal churches root themselves in the beginning of Acts where the Holy Spirit fell upon them in the time on the day of Pentecost. So they call themselves Pentecostal churches. In a very real way, we're a Pentecostal church. We're a charismatic church because we 100% believe in the gifts of the Spirit, that they're all available today, that they all operate today, and that God wants to see more of it, not less of it in your lives. We believe that too. However, we also believe that things should be done decently and in an order, like the Bible says. So a hyper expression is that we want to be as close to how the Bible describes these gifts so that they're done decently in order to glorify God and not to create confusion and chaos in a gathering like this. And so, you know, and I, some of you have visited churches. I know early on as a new believer, I visited a church where the gift of tongues was being exercised in a large gathering like this. And what literally what happened is there was somebody over there, and I'm not pointing at you, although I am pointing at you, but somebody over there that stood up and started speaking in tongues. And then over here, somebody stood up and answered them in tongues. And they were yelling and crying like, whoa, what is going on here? And that's not a biblical, that's not a biblical expression. Sometimes you also hear, on a hyper-expressionism viewpoint, you also hear somebody say, you know, I just don't see God working like today like he did in the book of Acts. I mean, read the book of Acts. It seemed like there was a miracle every day in the book of Acts. Like when you're reading through, man, this was happening, this was happening, this was happening. But... You have to understand a careful investigation in the book of Acts is going to yield you at least two things. Number one, if you go through the book of Acts and you count how many miracles took place, you'll probably come to the same number I did, about 30. There were 30, and that's significant, I would say, 30 dynamic, spiritual, miraculous manifestations of God in the life of the early church, about 30. 
But the way people talk about the book of Acts, they would, you would think that the book of Acts only covers 30 days of the life of the church. So that now, man, everything was happening every day. Everywhere they turned, it was happening every day, every day. No, no. From the beginning of Acts to the end of Acts covers a span of about 30 years, not 30 days. And so again, if you're gonna use that as an acknowledgement, the average of what God revealed to us of the miraculous was about once a year, which we know there was more than that, but that's not a good gauge to say, well, look, the book of Acts, they had a miracle a day. The Bible doesn't teach that. We don't know what they experienced, except that they experienced the miraculous of God. They experienced something that couldn't be explained humanly. They couldn't go back to a plan. As a matter of fact, many times the situations in their life caused them to throw away any human plan and completely throw themselves upon the mercy of God. That's what he wants in your life. The dynamic. He wants to give you a taste of the dynamic. And because of the extremes in the body of Christ today, we found it important to actually add a paragraph in our statement of faith for primarily only those that visit from another church read that that paragraph because it only applies because new believers, they don't know yet, so they don't understand. But for us, in number 20 on our statement of faith reads this way, and I'll read it to you, and I quote, We believe that the Bible clearly delineates that spiritual gifts are for the edification of the body and that they're to be exercised in love. We believe that love is more important than the most spectacular gifts and without love, all exercise of spiritual gifts is worthless. In our services, we focus on a personal relationship with God through worship, prayer, and the teaching of the word of God. We do not practice speaking in tongues during worship or while a Bible study is in progress because we don't believe that the Holy Spirit would interrupt himself. God is not the author of confusion. These gifts are encouraged in more intimate settings like your personal prayer time, afterglow services where their benefit can accomplish the purpose for which they've been given the edification of the body of Christ. And so with that, we have to ask then, what is an afterglow service? or what we might refer to as a believer's meeting, a gathering where there are believers. Turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 14, and we'll start to answer that question together. Now, the word afterglow actually comes to us from an episode in the life of Moses. You remember God was going to reveal his glory, the very presence of his person to Moses, but knew that if Moses saw God's glory for what it was, he would die on the spot. So in Exodus 33, we find God revealing his glory to Moses, but hiding Moses in the cleft of a rock, like kind of shielding him from seeing the fullness of his presence. But all that Moses saw was the afterglow of God passing by. He got to experience the fullness of what he could take in the very presence of the glory of God. And that's the mindset of why we would set aside. You see, in a time like this, you know, with about a thousand people in the room, we reserve this time for teaching. This is where the gift of pastor teachers exercise, the gift of teaching. And so there isn't a really an opportunity for you to stand up and give a prophecy, like right now, or stand up and share a tongue right now. As a matter of fact, if you did that, I would stop the service because you would be interrupting the teaching service and I would stop the service, like for example, if somebody stood up and started uttering something in a tongue. We don't know if it's a tongue or not, so what we would do is stop the service and ask the room, is there anyone that has the interpretation? And then we would wait for the interpretation. If there was an interpretation, then we would receive it, and then I would tell the person, don't do that again. By the way, in about 10 seconds, that person would be surrounded by five or six other people. They're known as the undercover security in our church. (laughs) They're here. And you want to find out who they are? Just jump up out, you know, no. So we would say, we would stop. And if there's no interpretation, then I would say, you know what, brother? I do exactly what I'm doing right now. I'd explain to them, this is not the time or the place for that particular gift. You're interrupting the work of the Holy Spirit and teaching his flock and his body. And we would do it in a decent and order way. But in an afterglow setting... When we come together, we'll we'll notice in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, I'll draw your attention to verse 26 now. This is a corrective instruction from Paul to the church in Corinth because they were operating with the gifts out of order and upside down. So notice what he says. How is it then, brethren, 
wherever you, whenever you come together, each of you has a psalm, has a teaching, has a tongue, has a revelation, has an interpretation. Let all things be done for edification. We're gonna read the next few verses in a moment, but here's what's happening. When they're gathering together, everybody is exercising their gift all at the same time. So there's a tongue over here and a prophecy over here and somebody's singing a song over here. Somebody's trying to teach over here and it's just a very loud, chaotic mess that is clearly not for the edification of other people. They're just interested in expressing their gift. They're just interested in uttering something, interested in some cases, I'm sure, in drawing attention to themselves through the spiritual gifts. But see, the gifts were not given to draw attention to ourselves. They were given to, build, to edify. Now, the word edification simply means to build someone up. Paul would put it this way, that we would think of others more highly than ourselves. That, that we have been saved to build other people's lives, not tear them down. That, that we, have been, we have been brought into the family of God to see how I can serve you, not how you can serve me. And the giftings and the exercise of the gifts are very important. So they were coming with, uh, with their gifts, but they were using them improperly. So he gives some explanation, verse 27. If you're gonna speak in a tongue, then there can only be two or three, and there needs to be an interpreter. But if there's no interpreter, then they must keep silent. Don't exercise that gift. Don't exercise that gift, because he's, he can, you can always speak to yourself and to God, which we call that prayer. You can exercise it in your prayer time. Let two or three prophets speak. Let the, word, uh, let the prophecy, let, let someone speak forth the word of God. And then let every, others judge. But if anything is revealed to another who sits by, let him keep silent. Don't try to talk over one another. Don't try to argue. You can all prophesy, notice, one by one. So that everyone can learn and everyone can be encouraged. And so... You might say to me, but wait a minute, Ed. And, and we've had some experiences over the years of different things happening in services. And as a brother, you come alongside a brother or sister, you put your arm around them and go, look, you're kind of interrupting. And no, no, man, the Holy Spirit told me to interrupt. Uh, probably not. Or I just can't control myself. The Spirit of God came upon me and I can't control myself. That is not true. Don't ever say that to anyone. That is not biblically true. On a couple of points, right? In Galatians, the Bible says that the fruit of the Spirit is self-control. And so don't blame the Holy Spirit for your flesh. Be careful, number one. Number two, look at the next verse. Paul tells them in verse 32, the spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet. That's another way of saying, yes, you can control yourself. The Spirit of God loves the things done decently in order, right? Verse 33, for God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches. Notice verse 40, let all things be done decently and in order. Notice in verse 26 that Paul says, how is it when you come together you have all these things, but you're not doing it edifying? He doesn't say don't do these things. He just simply says you're not doing them right. And this is how some of the thing, mistakes they were making. So in Afterglow, the biblical precedence for a gathering, a believer's gathering, is right here. You can have these things in an Afterglow, but let it be done to build one another up. Let it be done to strengthen one another. So in any Afterglow, although they're all very different, you're going to have a gathering of believers, and notice what's going to be there. Number one, there's going to be psalms, so we're going to sing to the Lord. Sometimes that's by the worship leader that will be there, but other times it's just somebody has a song in their heart, somebody wrote a song, and the Lord just prompts them to sing it for us and share the song that God put on their heart. I remember one time I was, uh, I was leading the Afterglow, and I felt this impression in my heart to share that there's somebody among us that has had a song on their heart all day long, and, and it started, and I had a specific thing, and it started, you started singing it in the shower this morning. And I just shared, I'm like, you know, sometimes the Lord will give you something to share. You're like, I don't know about this, but I shared it. It's like, you've been singing this song all day, but it really started in the shower. Well, guess what? That was for somebody there. They started singing a song in the shower and they brought it to us. And it was a very beautiful song glorifying God. And we all got to enjoy it together and just sense the presence of God. So there's gonna be songs there. Secondly, notice there's gonna be doctrine, right? There's gonna be teaching. Now, in a believer's meeting, don't let, don't let what we do on the weekends 
or on a Wednesday night, think, well, if I'm just going to come to an after school, another 45-minute Bible study, it's not a 45-minute Bible study. Or if you're like here and you go, you know, God's been giving me a lot of Bible studies, so it's the afterglow I get to come and teach all my Bible studies. No, no, it's just going to be real quick. There's going to be a five-minute exhortation or instruction in the Word, and then the teaching is going to come from the Holy Spirit through the people. And here's one way it usually happens. In a gathering, in an afterglow, many people will have a scripture impressed upon their heart. Maybe it's what they've been uh, meditating on during the day, or it's something God gave them, or they just really an impression in the moment, and they'll share that scripture out loud. They'll read the scripture. And when I'm leading, and the other guys, I think, do the same thing, I always remind you that if God gives you a scripture, would you please ask him why? Why that scripture? What was the reason? What's the purpose? And if God gives you the reason and the purpose, give that to us. And that usually reflects a teaching. They give a verse, and sometimes there's a theme of verses that kind of get lined together. It's a beautiful thing. It's never really the same each time. But there's going to be a teaching. Then notice in verse 26, there's going to be a tongue. There's going to be the gift of tongues exercise. A lot of, a lot of times you're afraid of the gift of tongues or the interpretation of tongues because you just think, you know, I'm not going to go to afterglows. This is just weird, man. That's just weird. That doesn't make any sense. It's weird. And I, I want you to know, God is not weird. You might be weird. God's not weird. I might be weird, but God is not weird. The exercising of his gifts is a very beautiful thing. Now, I would say, though, if you've never experienced it before, it might be different for you, but it's not weird. To yield yourself and to be in a room where people are obeying God and seeking God together, that is not weird at all. And to watch God, by the time we finish, to watch and see, because I always like taking notes of what he's saying and what he's doing, and then I'll go back and I'll say, what were you really saying to the church, Lord? And what was that word? And that, what are you really saying to me personally? When you gather together, there'll be tongues. And, and really, that, that, that really is a beautiful thing. And, and, it, and it hasn't been all that weird. You know, on occasion, there, is, there are those that, on, on some occasions, they really are just there to draw attention to themselves. And we disciple them in a way to say, look, bro, this is for the edification of the body. And, you know, they're, they're, that, that's very rare. On other occasions, you know, we, people don't know how to exercise their gifts, and so they're trying. That's okay. It's a good place to learn and grow and release yourself to the Lord. But everyone's afraid. You know, I was recently with a group of pastors, and we were talking about this very thing, and, you know, how do you handle this situation? How do you handle that situation? And so my encouragement, my offering to that conversation was simply, look, just continue to do what God has called you to do, and if something weird happens, just deal with the weird. That's it. Just deal with the weird. Most of the time, it doesn't happen that way. Most of the time, it's just a free-flowing, yeah, it might be different. It may not be all so scheduled and exactly what you expected, but you know, that's life. That's not just a church service. That's life. And if there's something weird, just love on that person. Express love that maybe they don't know. Like, we're so quick to write people off. Would you stop doing that? We're just so quick to dismiss people because they do something different or, or they, they act different. Like, like, let's just be filled with the love of God and minister to people and express love to them. And that, yeah, maybe they made a mistake. Okay, don't you make mistakes? Anybody make a mistake here? I do. And I just want to have that free-flowing place of love. And yeah, even in the Corinthian church, they were making mistakes. And so what did Paul do? He corrected the mistakes. And that's what's going to happen with us. And it really is very rare, quite frankly, as the Holy Spirit really does take control. But then in any of our afterglows, our pastors are there. I, I attend every, when I'm not traveling, I'm at the afterglow. And our pastoral team is there. Our school ministry will be there. Where there will be men there, godly men, some of the elders uh, will be there. In case something happens, we'll just lovingly take care of it as the leadership of the church. But it's a beautiful thing. And then notice there's also a revelation in verse 26 where God will just reveal something to you. You know, and it, it, it's, it's so different. Word of wisdom, word of knowledge. It's just generally an openness to the work of the Spirit. Now, let me show you what it looks like in practice. Could turn over to Acts chapter 13 as we have a little hint of what an afterglow looked like in the early church. It's really cool that you could read through this <clears throat> so quickly that you miss the dynamic speaking of the Holy Spirit. You know, the Holy Spirit speaks today. 
just like he did in the book of Acts. The Holy Spirit is still speaking. Don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying to you that the Holy Spirit is writing new pages in the Bible or adding to the Bible or somehow, con you know, obviously if somebody says the Holy Spirit gave them something and it contradicts the Bible, that wasn't from the Holy Spirit. But God is still leading today. He's still guiding and he's still speaking. Let me show you what I mean. Acts chapter 13, verse one. <clears throat> now in the church that was at Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers Barnabas, Simeon, who's called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manaean, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. And as they ministered to the Lord, I love that, they came together to minister to the Lord. They came together not to be ministered to by the Lord, not to receive from the Lord, they came to serve the Lord. They came, really, this phrase could be better translated, they came in a position of expectation. They came to serve the Lord. And I don't mean in the activities of the life of the church. I mean, they came ready to receive. God speak to us, move upon us, encourage us, comfort us. As they're ministering to the Lord, notice, and they were fasting. <clears throat> What's the next phrase say? Read it with me. The, say it out loud. The Holy Spirit said. So here's a gathering of believers where the Holy Spirit is speaking. Notice what he says. Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then, verse 3, having fasted and prayed, <clears throat> they laid hands on them and sent them away. So being sent out, notice this, sent out by the Holy Spirit. Man doesn't get credit for this. They weren't sent out by the prophets and they weren't sent out by the teachers and they weren't sent out by the church. They were sent out by who, church? The Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit sent them out. They went to Seleucia and there sailed to Cyprus. So let's do a little Bible study here. You ready? You have a group of believers together in the church in Antioch. They're there in a place of reception and expectation. And then in an instant of time, the Holy Spirit spoke. Now, one of the things you have to do when you're studying the Bible is context is everything. You have to answer the question right from the context. So how do you suppose the Holy Spirit spoke audibly in that group of believers? Say it out loud. What do you think? Through the prophets and teachers. Because this is what we think. We think, oh, I know how the Holy Spirit spoke. Hello, church. I'm glad you came to me today. I've got a word for you. It's kind of like, you know, when Buckley's, those, those jets take off from Buckley and they fly over. Like they, the noise just penetrates this building. I mean, it's just so loud. And a lot of people think that's what, I'm the Holy Spirit and I've got some, hold on, calm down everybody, I've got a word for you. No, the Holy Spirit spoke audibly through the pastors and teachers there, through the prophets. He used their mouths to communicate so that they heard him, they spoke forth his word, then they obeyed him, which is a different Bible study altogether. The Holy Spirit speaks today. And he uses the voices of believers, confirming in the word of God, of course, but he uses your voice and mine to speak today. That's why you can listen to a Bible study and you're like, man, the Lord really spoke to me. Well, how did he do that? Through the teaching of the word. <laughs> the Lord really spoke to me. Yeah, but it was just a guy up there talking for 40 minutes. Yeah, but God spoke to me. That's why you need to be in a church, a church family, you're here, you're listening on the radio right now or watching online. You need to be in a church family where you walk out the door not saying, what a great message. You walk out the door saying, what a great God. He spoke to me. He ministered to me. He encouraged me. He helped me. Why? Because the gift of pastor teacher was exercised. You know, if I asked you today, if I gave you a quiz and I said, okay, everybody, who's the teacher today? And you know, you see Ed up here and you go, well, you know, I guess it's you, Ed. You're the pastor. You're the teacher today. And if you were to answer that, you'd only be partially correct. Let me, I would ask it a different way. Okay, who's the primary teacher today to which you would have to answer the Holy Spirit? He's the only teacher in this room today. The only way that I will be effective is if the Holy Spirit uses me through his gifting to communicate the word of God to you personally, to your heart. I'm always amazed. It, 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 it absolutely amazes me, first of all, that God would use me and that secondly, he would use the gift of pastor teacher to take the same text, same message, and minister a different word to thousands of people at the same time. 
Only God can do that. It's not about hitting the head, but hitting the heart. And so the Holy Spirit spoke. You know, I have to tell you, husbands, husbands, listen. The Holy Spirit still speaks today. And many times the voice of the Holy Spirit sounds like your wife. (laughs) Wives, that's just a little bonus, no extra charge for you today. But it's true. I can't tell you how many times God has spoken to me through the voice of my wife. She has spoken a word. I am in Aurora today serving you, having the privilege of being a part of your family because the Holy Spirit spoke to me in 1999 as we were driving into another city through the voice of my wife who said something like, Ed, there's no way in the world I'm going to live in this city. (laughs) That began a series of revelations in my life to go back to California, reset, and then God did a work to bring us here. God still speaks today. And one of the ways that we, so the reason we have regular gatherings that we call afterglows here, the second Sunday of every month, which is tonight, we'll have one tonight. And somebody asked me if there was gonna be any childcare. There's no childcare, so only bring your kids if they can understand how to wait on the Holy Spirit. And you could use it to teach them. Um, but it, there's no childcare, so it's not, it's, it's a, an adult believers meeting. And I encourage you to come because I think the Lord will speak tonight. And as you gather together, it's coming to a place of expectation. And it's to test you, or excuse me, to give you a taste of what it's like to live in the dynamic power of the Holy Spirit. And they're different all the time. You know, we're not coming together so that it can be some supernatural encounter. Because you can have that anywhere at any time with God. God lives in you. We're not coming so that we can draw attention. We're not, all the activities in an afterglow should help us to know Jesus in a deeper, more intimate way. They should make us realize how much God loves us, that he speaks to us today, that he understands our situation, that he cares about us. In this, it's it's not just limited to a believer's meeting because here's the problem. The problem is so many believers think that they can live the Christian life pleasing God in their own strategies, their own power, and their own ability, and you must be reminded that God supersedes all of that, that he wants to lead you and guide you in your home. He wants to help you to be the man and the woman that you want to be. He wants to show you things you don't even know yet. He wants to speak things to you you haven't even heard yet. He wants to demonstrate that he is not just a book that's studied. As a matter of fact, God is not a book at all. He's the author of the book. And that's why we read books. We want to hear from the author. As we've seen in earlier studies, it's so easy to define the Trinity, you know, God's revealed himself as a Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. But in a church like ours, where we value the Word of God, where we study the Word of God, where we use the Word of God, where we teach it verse by verse, it can be very easy to think that the Trinity is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Bible, and it's not. The Bible came from God, the Bible is not God. It is his very God-breathed words But when the Bible does what it was given to do, what it accomplishes is it makes you fall in love more with the author. Even as I, we had the baby dedication today and I was writing that note. And as I write to that baby, one day she'll be able to read it and understand it for herself. But I write, look, God loves you, gave his life for you. He also gave you his Bible so that the more you read it, the more you will fall in love with him and learn about his love for you. It's about experiencing God, not just knowing him intellectually, but really being able to say, I felt the presence of God. I feel his word. I hear his word. And I think that as we're gathering, we're not just to leave, you know, overwhelmed and, oh, that was dynamic and great leader, great worship. We, We aren't to leave confused. We're to leave empowered and reminded of the love of God in our lives, that our eyes would be on that which is eternal, not, not just the temporary things of life, that the source of our strength is his spirit. Like it says in Zechariah chapter four, verse six, look mom, look dad, some of you came in with heavy hearts over your kids and it's not by might and it's not by power, but it's by his spirit, says the Lord. It is not through our crafty ideas and, and our working things around. We need to be praying for our kids, loving our kids, serving our kids, and being available to them as they sort things out in this upside down world. But it's not your might, because you feel like, man, I'm just, I don't know what to do. That's actually a really good place to be. Because the story of 
unfolding over and over again the true story of the men and women that serve God so often came to a place of I don't know what to do, which is going to lead to the next question, isn't it? God, what do I do? And he's ready. He is ready to lead you and guide you and minister to you and speak to you. And it didn't take too long for those living in the first century to experience the power of God, to experience it, to feel it, to receive it. That emphasis upon the spirit of God in our lives. He lives in you, believer, and he wants to express himself through you. God uses these times in miraculous ways, in wonderful ways, and they're never the same. We don't, I don't, we don't have them planned. We don't have specific themes. We do have specific pastors. Different pastors lead. Different guys lead us in worship. But we just wait for what God's going to reveal. And I remember, sometimes they're very dynamic, very powerful. Sometimes you walk away going, well, I don't know. I was just, but you walk away, maybe you didn't feel or experience anything, but you obeyed him. That's pretty powerful, just to be in a place of obedience. But it was a few years ago where I had a really bad week, bad, probably a bad month. I'd have to go back specifically to read in my diary because I jotted it all down, but I don't really want to read about it. But I remember pieces of it. And I had gone, came here and taught the weekend services and I just was exhausted. I was in a foul mood and I was really upset about something happening in my life and some things being done to me by another family and all the passive aggressive stuff and all the nonsense uh, that's still happening even to this day. But back then it was really, really bad and, and I was just gonna take care of it myself. That's where I was. I was so mad, so frustrated. And that Sunday night was our afterglow. So being the great spiritual pastor that I am that's going to take things into his own hands, does he want to come to the afterglow? No. I just wanted to go home and go to bed. My day off is on Monday. I figure I'd go to bed, wake up Tuesday morning, maybe I'll feel better. And so I'm processing all this. And I'm, I mean, it was so bad. I was like, like, you know, just stick a fork in me, man. I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. Anybody ever been done? Okay, a few people. The rest of you are well done. <laughs> so I was upset. I was, it was just a bad day. I was going to handle things in a fleshly way that would have been disastrous. And who knows how it would have ended. It just wouldn't have been good. So I go to bed and, and I'm, I'm thinking, no, I don't want to go. But I'm the pastor. I got to go. And you know, I'm, it's like, oh, I'm just wrestling with everything. And so I'll just go to bed. And then if I sleep through it, oh, well, I slipped through it. But I woke up in like 15, 20 minutes. I don't know what it was. And I'm like, oh. What time is it? Oh, I just, I didn't get any sleep. And then I started thinking, well, you go to the after, go, no, I don't want to go. Yeah, just go. Well, if you don't go, and this is all, you, you know, you have an inside voice and you have an outside voice. So this is all the inside voice. If you saw me outside, I'd be smiling and ha ha, you know, but inside I'm like, oh, I don't want to go. And then Marie won't go. And then the kids won't go. And just like, man, what a bad example. And so I finally decide to go, but I don't want to be there. So I show up. I sit down, don't really talk to anyone. You know, people might have thought I was upset with them or something that had nothing to do with you. I'm sitting there, put my head down, and I'm waiting for the afterglow to be over. From the very, before it even started, I wanted it to be over. And as they started, Pastor Matt was leading that evening. As they started, uh, God began to move. And right in front of me, somebody shared a word, and I felt like the Lord was saying, that's for you. And I said, no, it's not. And they kept going. Then there was the one over here. And the Lord said, I think that's for you. And I said, no, it's not for me. I didn't come here to hear a word. And I'm just wrestling in the flesh. And I literally, I remember it like it was yesterday. It literally, God spoke literally around the room in a circle. Till finally at the end of the day, the last person to speak was the person sitting directly behind me. One of those words was so powerful, I got an elbow from Marie. I don't know if you ladies do that, but like I got bruised right here. That's for you, man. That's for you. I was like, it's not for me. Leave me alone. It's not for me. And so the one behind, I mean, it was a, there was a theme. That evening, God was speaking to me through all the various words and scriptures and everything that was going on that night. And then the end of the afterglow comes, Pastor Matt comes back up front he kind of closes everything. And Pastor Matt's the right guy to be there that night because he's more of a black and white brother. Uh, you know, yes or no, good or bad, obey or disobey. And so he gets up and he begins to share. I think that was somebody for someone and you should probably stand up. We could pray for you. And, and, and I'm like, there is no way I'm standing up. I'm the pastor. What are people going to think? I'm literally, seriously thinking like, no way. What am I going to stand up and go, I'm an idiot. I was going to go ruin my life right now. Oh, by the way, come to Wednesday night service. You know, like, like, no, I'm not going to stand up. 
This wasn't for me. No. And I'm really mad. I'm fighting with God. And then he shares the word. So his, his encouragement wasn't enough for me. Still then. But when he opened the word, he shared something like, you know, the passage, it's better to obey than sacrifice. And like, you know, God knows who I am. I'm not a perfect man at all. But he knows, he made me, that I can't live with disobedience in my life. I, again, I'm not, I'm not perfect. Like, I don't, I'm not a perfect man that never disobeys. But I can't live with something I know is wrong. It just eats me up. I got to get it right. And so he's like, so, so that, you know, this is all happening in seconds. This is all happening. Like, God just boom, 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 boom. And it's like, you know, I don't remember if he said, we'll wait for you, but he got me really mad. I'm not mad anymore, but he got really mad. And I'm like, well, what else am I supposed to do? I just got to obey. And so I, I began to weep, and I stood up, and I was surrounded by everybody. They prayed for me, and I didn't take things into my own hands. And God even removed the desire from me that night. And I was a little bit, I felt a little bit better. Not super better, but I felt a little bit better because God reminded me how much he loved me. How much he was for me, not against me. How much he understood my plight. How he was a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. How he had people lie about him and go against him. And I mean, he laid it. We're talking all of that was just a flood of emotion that I could say, not only did I know God was in that room that night, but I felt God in that room that night. I feel God in this room now, and he still speaks. He still speaks to you. And so we have these times so that you can break away and just be open. I know everyone, you know, many people are afraid of him because it's going to be weird. It's not going to be weird. God loves you. He's not going to make things hard for you. You make things hard for you. God doesn't do that. He makes a way where there is no way. He opens doors that no man can close. He closes doors that no man can open, and he loves you. And so in the life of your particular fellowship family, these times of afterglows are training ground for you to learn how to live in the presence of the Spirit all throughout the week, all throughout the month, so that you know that God loves you, and that you know that he's with you, and that he supernaturally ministers even today in this culture, in this life. There's nothing weird or out of order when the Spirit of God is moving among his people for the glory that only comes to him. And that's why we reserve these nights. And that's why your high schoolers have these days. And that's why junior highs do it. And that's why men's groups do it. And why we want to walk in the spirit. We don't want to be a church that's all dependent upon man and what man can do and all dependent on, well, we always done it that way. And oh, that's all, you know, if you do anything different, then you're not a real, like, like, listen, God is dynamic and we need to be ready to move on a dime when he tells us to move. And we need to learn how to stop when he tells us to stop. And we more importantly need to learn to be open vessels so he could pour more of his love in us so that we can be loving vessels to a lost and dying world. We pray that you've been encouraged by this Bible study delivered live from the sanctuary of Calvary Aurora. For prayer or a copy of this study, call us at 877-30-GRACE. That's 877 304 7223 or visit us online at calvaryaurora.org Be blessed as you worship Jesus this week.